So, my talk is not about skyscrapers, however. I know it's called How to Build a Skyscraper, but I assure you it's not about skyscrapers. What I did think was really interesting um, is, you know, because everybody, when they give a talk, the first thing they do is go to Wikipedia and look up whatever they can find about the topic, right? Um, I think this is interesting. The uh, Wikipedia article on uh, skyscraper design and construction says, the problems posed in skyscraper design are considered among the most complex encountered, given the balances required between economics, engineering, and construction management. I know some things that are similar in that. Um, so, without further ado, let's talk about our first skyscraper. Uh, Equitable Life Building in New York in 1870. It was the tallest in the world uh, and it, for about 14 years. It was seven stories tall, which is funny when you think in terms of skyscrapers today. Uh, it had been built as fireproof, which was, uh, is important for reasons we'll discuss later. It had tenants uh, like bankers and lawyers. It even had an exclusive lawyers club where all the lawyers could hang out. Um, and the basement housed safes and vaults that were filled with several billions, and I did say billions, in 1870 of securities, stocks, and bonds. It was basically the center of most of the wealth of the New York financial district. And it showed, I mean, this place was gorgeous. It was a beautiful building. The architecture is just amazing. It had one uh, important problem. Can you spot it in this photo? There were stairs. Um, and the problem, of course, is if you're a lawyer and you're located in a seven-story building, uh, if you're on the seventh floor of a seven-story building, you're not going to have any clients because nobody wants to climb that many stairs. So that's a problem. Thankfully, this problem had a solution. Um, there was a man named Elisha Otis. Uh, who was a tinkerer. He was really the, uh, the kind of person you think of when you say someone is an inventor. He was, he was always tinkering with something, and his sons were the same. And in 1851, at age 40, he was the manager of an abandoned sawmill that he was converting into a bed frame factory. And while cleaning up, he was wondering how he could get all the old debris um, from the floor to the upper levels. Now, elevators existed uh, at this point, um, but they did have an, one really important, fatal, literally, flaw. If the rope cut on the, uh, the elevator, then anything on it was dead or broken because the elevator just fell down. Um, Elisha Otis designed uh, a safety elevator. At that time, he was calling it, I believe, a safety hoist. And um, it wouldn't fall to the ground if it broke. Um, he had this cool mechanism here that I got the arrow pointing to, where there were these spring-loaded uh, mechanisms so that when the rope was cut, if the rope was cut, spring would release the tension, it would push, the, uh, it would push the, uh, these kind of fins out into these teeth that you see on the side of the elevator shaft there, and it would keep the elevator from falling more than maybe a meter. So he didn't think much of this. Uh, he didn't patented it. He didn't ask his superiors to give him a bonus for it. Uh, he didn't even try to sell it. But three years later, um, the bed frame business was not booming, and he was looking to try something new. And so he formed a company to sell the elevators. He got no business at all, no orders at all for several months. Um, and then came the 1854 New York World's Fair, and he had a really great opportunity to demonstrate the elevator in a dramatic way. Uh, by the way, uh, I just got to point out, that guy, now this is a pencil drawing. That guy in the bottom right, I'd like to think he's kind of the world's first photo bomb. He's kind of like, hey, look at me. It's a pencil drawing. So either he posed for a really long time or the artist took the time to, to anyway. So, so he did this demonstration and he had somebody cut the rope um, and he did not fall to his death, which was very impressive at the time for all the people there. That guy didn't, he missed it. He looked the other way. Everybody else was impressed. Um, and so the thing is, is elevators ran on steam engines in that day, so someone had to keep them constantly fueled. But even so, this was a huge development. Um, later, they would be improved to run on electricity. So the first takeaway uh, that I want you to get is that higher is better, but only if you're able to move up and down easily. You know, previously, the, the lowest floors of buildings were the most desirable because nobody wanted to climb stairs. So if you owned a building, you would um, hold the top floors for yourself and rent out the lower floors because you could get higher rents. Um, now, with a safe means to travel easily to and from the highest floors, uh, the ones with the most light and the fresh air and the distance from the noise are up top. So they were where people wanted to be. 
And so a solution that seems unremarkable to you might just change everything for others. So share what you built. Think about this though, I mean, it really did flip the real estate market at that time on its head. Literally turned it upside down. Also, if a failure occurs, don't let people fall all the way down. In the best case, you're gonna end up with tenants who are dazed and confused, and when they come to their senses, um, they're gonna be looking for a new place to rent. In the worst case, you're gonna kill people, also bad. Um, so, Cafe Sauveron, uh, in January 1912, this is a, uh, this is a really kind of swanky cafe, fancy cafe. Uh, this is the bar area that existed in uh, the Equitable Building. Um, January 9th, 1912, just after 5 a.m., uh, the wind is howling. It's nearly 64 kilometers per hour. It gusts up to 109 kilometers per hour. It was already below freezing outside. This was making things even colder. Uh, Philip O'Brien at the time was the, uh, the timekeeper, sort of a, a night watchman uh, for the building. He started his day by lighting the gas in his small office, um, and he threw the still-lit match into the garbage can. Uh, he thinks, uh, according to this article that came out a couple of days later, that he threw it on the floor, but what happened next uh, is going to tell the tale. So by 5.18 a.m., the office was engulfed, engulfed in flames. The flames spread to the elevators, the dumbwaiter systems, and within minutes, the entire equitable building is on fire. The fire department arrived, but the water was freezing on the building as they tried to put out the flames. And so the fireproof building that had billions of dollars in its basement uh, was utterly ruined. Uh, a takeaway from this is that you should never underestimate the power of people to ruin your beautiful thing. <laughs> it's good to uh, test your claims. Um, but again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. The next skyscraper that we want to talk about is the Home Insurance Building in Chicago, Illinois, 1885. Um, the architect on this project was William LeBaron Jenny, and uh, he, built, he built this building to be 43 meters tall. It was considered by most the father of the skyscraper. The equitable building didn't meet certain criteria that uh, architects consider necessary for it to be a skyscraper. It was the tallest in the world until 1889, and the thing that was unique about this building is that it was built with cast iron columns and rolled iron beams uh, that formed a framework for the building up to the sixth floor. They used steel beams in the floors above six, up to the tenth floor. Um, now the majority of the curtain wall, what they call a curtain wall in skyscrapers, it's literally all of the masonry that you see there, all of the, of the stone that you see there, is hanging from the steel and iron frame. And this was critical for, for a, a skyscraper to be considered a skyscraper. Um, majority of the curtain wall was hung from the frame in this case, not 100%. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So this made the building drastically lighter, like one-third the weight of uh, a stone building. And the rumor has it that the way that this occurred was that uh, William LeBaron and Jenny left work early one, one day, and he came home. His wife was startled, thought maybe he was ill. Uh, and she jumped up to greet him, and she set this heavy book on a, on a birdcage. And uh, inspiration struck. And since this is the 1800s, I'm sure this is exactly how Jenny said it. If so frail a frame of wire would sustain so great a weight without yielding, would not a cage of iron or steel serve as a frame for a building? I think that's how he said it, pretty much. So uh, seek inspiration in unexpected places. He got the idea from a birdcage and it changed the way people were building. Now, the, the funny thing about this is it was very controversial at the time, um, because if you were a New Yorker, you did not call the home insurance building built in Chicago the first skyscraper. If you were a Chicagoan, on the other hand, you sure did. And so um, it was technicality, really, this idea that not 100% of the, of the masonry was hung from the frame, and so that wasn't really accurate. Some of the load was borne by the stone. So, Pro tip, haters gonna hate. Don't let that stop you from building. But here are these people in Chicago building this awesome building uh, on an iron and steel framework. And uh, it's clearly a technical accomplishment. It's, it's importantly serving the needs of people who occupy it. And yet it's easier to come along afterwards and just debate how much of an accomplishment it really was. Um, this guy does not look happy, right? This is Leroy Buffington. Um, he claims he had the same idea for this steel and iron frame back in 1881. He applied for a patent in uh, 87, was awarded it in May of 88, and he actually started a company called the Iron Building Company, specifically to pursue lawsuits. We don't know anything about that. So um, here, here's the problem. 
Uh, there was a flax mill as early as 1797 uh, in Shrewsbury that uh, used iron in its framing. Not completely to load bear or anything like that, but it was pretty obviously prior art. Lesson here, patent troll's gonna patent troll. Um, but again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. Next skyscraper we're gonna talk about is the Man Manatnock building in Chicago as well. Two brothers named uh, Peter and Shepard Brooks. You see Peter here. Uh, Peter is the money guy. You can tell he's the money guy because people made paintings of him. Um, and he has a wonderful mustache. Um, they believed Chicago was gonna be the largest city in the US. Um, and they hired this Owen F. Aldis guy to manage their property investments. Now, Peter only ever visited Chicago once. Uh, his brother Shepard never visited Chicago, but they seemed to feel that Chicago was gonna be the place to be. They just didn't wanna be there. Um, and so they relied on all this to keep them informed. They hired an architecture firm, uh, Burnham and Root. Uh, it was very cleverly named because of Daniel Burnham and John Root being the guys who ran it um, to design the building. Um, and so Manatnock Building's first design was uh, in 1885. It was only uh, 13 stories tall. It had this kind of uh, immaculate Egyptian-inspired architecture. You see these kind of ornaments on the top of the building there. This is all Egyptian-themed. Now, Peter Brooks was known for his stinginess and his preference for simplicity, but Root was a very creative guy. Burnham was sort of the business guy. Root was the creative guy. Brooks insisted the architects refrain from elaborate ornamentation. In fact, he didn't want any protrusions at all from the building because they just created places for pigeons to nest, according to him. Apparently, Brooks had a problem with pigeons. So when Root went on vacation, Burnham had another draftsman create a very simple drawing. And you know, initially Root was very unhappy about this, but later he threw himself into the design, declaring that the heavy lines of an Egyptian pyramid had captured his imagination, and he would throw the thing up without a single ornament. So a lesson from this is that we should learn to embrace constraints because they're gonna be everywhere all the time. So we may as well learn to work within them. Now, the change sketch in 1889, um, Aldous had actually talked Brooks into a little bit of protrusion there. You can see these kind of uh, areas where the windows come out on the front of the building uh, to increase rentable space. And in fact, the entire height of the building was calculated by determining how high we could feasibly make the building while still having sufficient space to rent due to wall thickness. Because with this kind of a building where the masonry is actually holding up the walls, the walls get thicker as you go down. And down at the bottom of the walls, they were almost two meters thick. So you can imagine this cuts in on the usable space of the building. Uh, Chicago had really soft soil, and they had built what they thought was a pretty ingenious raft system to sort of distribute the load of the building so that it would not sink into the soil. Um, the building ended up being 66 meters tall. That's 17 stories, including the attic, and it was the tallest of any commercial structure at the time. Um, it's still the tallest commercial iron frame building with a load-bearing exterior masonry wall. Now, the building was designed to settle about 20 centimeters, but by 1905 it had settled that much and quite a bit more, and so they had to reconstruct the first floor. By 1948, it had settled over half a meter into the ground, and you actually, they had to build a step down so that you could get into the building because it was sinking. Um, and surprise, surprise, in 1967, this article says it is still sinking. It's found to be sinking. They didn't know it was sinking before, and now they know again, apparently. Um, if your only concern is profitability, do not be surprised when you start sinking. Profitability is one important factor to consider, but it can't be the only one. But again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. The Fuller Flatiron Building was an interesting skyscraper uh, in New York, built in uh, 1902. Uh, Daniel Burnham uh, had still been involved in the design of this building, uh, but his partner John Root actually passed away during the construction of the Manatnik. So he uh, brought on Frederick Dinkelberg, who has an awesome name, Dinkelberg, I like it, um, to design the Fuller Flatiron. Um, this is the Fuller Flatiron, it's 87 meters tall. Uh, it was originally supposed to be just named the Fuller Building after another architect that had recently uh, been deceased, uh, George A. Fuller. But um, locals insisted on calling it the Flatiron. Now I assume this had something to do with the construction of the building, but it didn't. Um, if you look at the shape of the building, uh, it actually resembles an iron, a clothes iron, and they called them flat irons in the day, and so um, they actually named it because it looked like a flat iron. Um, and at the tip, 
that front tip of the building there is only two meters wide, which uh, necessitated some adjustments in that we just talked about how the Monatnock building had to be two meters wide at the walls at the base of the building. Well, that's not gonna fly whenever the entire tip of your building is only that wide. You're gonna lose way too much space. And so you can see, here's a view uh, present day from one of those corner offices. Uh, it was um, actually not close to that narrow, or to that, that wide of a wall. You have uh, very narrow walls there. They're definitely not two meters thick. So you know, how did they actually accomplish that? Well, we'll talk about it in a second, but one thing to take away at the moment is that uh, the space that you work, have to work with should influence how you build. Um, and, of course, if you're going to have a building, it's better to finish the building than to have half of a building. So choose the right materials for the job. In this case, it wasn't stone, it was steel. So if you take a look at this steel frame as it's going up, um, you might not be surprised to hear that the, the locals were actually calling the building Burnham's Folly. They were, taking, they were literally taking bets on how far the building's debris would, would actually spread after the building blew over when the wind hit it. And I mean, it, do, it looks like that, except here's the thing. Corden Purdy uh, is an engineer that lived in the time and was involved in more skyscrapers than just about anyone else during this period of time. He had designed this bracing system that was tested to withstand four times the amount of wind that the Flatiron was ever going to see. So during a 96 kilometer per hour windstorm that hit soon after the first tenants moved in, um, you couldn't feel the slightest vibration in the building. And in fact, one tenant claimed that not even the filament in the light bulb above his desk would quiver. The tip here is that uh, testing makes it possible to be confident about what we build, even when others aren't. But again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. In 1930, two buildings went up uh, very rapidly. I think they both opened about a month apart. Uh, 40 Wall Street and the Chrysler Building. The two architects involved in these two buildings uh, were H. Craig Severance and William Van Allen. Now, Severance and Van Allen had been partners at another firm the previous time, and then they went into business together. Um, they were very, very different personalities. Van Allen was uh, the type of guy who preferred to spend his time uh, with other architects, uh, debate the finer points of design. He, he was definitely an artist. Um, and Severance, on the other hand, was a business guy. Uh, he spent time with the business folks, drumming up sales, and humility was not his strong point. Um, he had no particular passion for architecture as art, um, and you know, he could have been a doctor or a lawyer. He'd have done them all equally well as far as he was concerned. So it's interesting then that even though he kind of wasn't that passionate about it, he got very offended when Van, Al Van Allen would regularly receive praise for the buildings that were designed because he was the artist. Uh, he felt responsible as well because without the connections that Severance had gotten, the buildings would never have gotten commissioned to begin with. Um, their partnership, needless to say, did not last very long. It ended very badly. Um, on the left, we have 40 Wall Street. Uh, it's currently known as the Trump Building. Back then, it was known as the Bank of Manhattan Trust Building. And on the right, we have the Chrysler Building today. So Severance had assembled a team. He had a dream team uh, consisting of his associate, Yasuo Matsui, and consulting architect, Shreven Lam, during the design of 40 Wall Street. Uh, Walter Chrysler, the guy who ran Chrysler, the, the motor company, builds cars, uh, had the building designed for his car company, but he paid for it himself uh, out of his own pocket so his children could inherit the building. He was obsessed with every detail of the building that he would later describe as a monument to me. Um, so the buildings were announced only a month apart. You'll see the Chrysler building was announced on, in March of 1929, and the 40 Wall Street was announced in April of 1929. You'll also notice that, uh, through no coincidence, um, Severance one-upped his former uh, partner by announcing a higher height, a uh, taller building to be the world's tallest. And this started off a race. Um, in October of 1929, Severance visited the site of his construction. And uh, he could already tell at this point that they were building higher than they had originally claimed. The Chrysler building was not going to be ending at 246 meters. It was going to get taller than that. Um, but their building had slowed because they were putting that dome that you saw at the top of the building on, and they could only go so much further before it would have to top out. And so he felt pretty confident that he was going to win the race. But um, Chrysler had the press announcing that the steelwork was complete on the Chrysler building, even though it really wasn't, uh, making the Chrysler building just barely the tallest in the world at the time, at a revised height of 259 meters. So 40 Wall Street was catching up, 
um, not done yet. Chrysler Building was winding down, uh, and, but they were announcing that they were the tallest. Now, Severance had already put in motion plans to build higher than announced, so he wasn't really worried. Uh, the month, though, was filled with announcements from all manner of people that were claiming that they were going to build the world's tallest. It was, it was kind of a, a great time to get some free press by announcing you were going to build a giant building every time you bought some land. It didn't matter if you did it, you just got your face in the newspaper. Um, Van Allen was silent the entire time because he, Chrysler, and a few select others knew that they were building way higher than anyone actually thought they were building. So in the third week of October, Severance heard about an 18-meter flagpole that had been spotted at the Chrysler building. And so he decides, well, he's not going to beat me by a few meters by putting a flagpole on the top of his building. So he raised the plans for his building again. Now, Severance is a business guy. He knows there's no business justification for this at this point. This is strictly ego. The um, article hits on uh, uh, October 18th um, about the skyscraper race being won and uh, the Mag Bank of Manhattan building is won. Now, this has happened because um, Severance now has leaked information that he has changed the plans. He's going to be at uh, 282 meters while the Chrysler building would top out at 276 meters, including this flagpole that Severance had heard about. Uh, only it wasn't a flagpole. The flagpole was one part of a 56-meter spire that Van Allen had been calling the Vertex. He had built it off-site in five pieces and shipped each piece to the building separately, hoisted them into the upper floors, and slid them down into the upper floors where they had changed the floor plans subtly to allow them to partially assemble these, these pieces inside the building where no one could see. On October 23rd, they hoisted the base up, they riveted the rest of the pieces into place within 90 minutes, and Van Allen and Chrysler went to sleep that night knowing that their skyscraper was the tallest in the world. But the, the best part about it is that no one actually noticed when they raised it up. I mean, the building wasn't all shiny and finished. It was just kind of, you know, bare steel. And so everybody just assumed it was a large crane or something at the top of the building. They, they didn't know what it was. And so they worked to keep it that way. They didn't want Severance to change his plans again. So they're just like, hey, it's up there. We know we won. You know, it's okay. And so... So the article comes out on November 12th that uh, the world's tallest building raises the stars and stripes to the New York heavens. Only the article wasn't about the Chrysler building. It was about 40 Wall Street. Um, and so about four days later, some kind of no-name building trade report uh, uh, wrote up uh, an article that said that the Chrysler building was over 72 meters taller than anyone actually thought. And uh, so the final numbers here... Uh, 319.5 meters for the Chrysler building versus 282.5 for 40 Wall Street. They both cost in the, in the neighborhood of 13 to 14 million to build. Uh, naturally, Chrysler's a little taller, Chrysler's a little richer, he built a little higher and spent a little more. Uh, the lesson here is that bu big buildings are expensive and uh, big, big egos are even more expensive. Think for a moment about how much extra expense was incurred on these buildings just because of these two guys grudge against one another. Uh, and the, the worst part about it is that after the work was finished, Chrysler refused to pay Van Allen for the work. There was a 6% standard design fee uh, upon completion. And this would have been in, in that time, uh, in the 1930s, uh, it's $840,000 of 1930s money. That's, that's good money that he was owed. Uh, but because he hadn't entered into a contract when he received the commission to build the Chrysler building, uh, Van Allen actually had to sue to get paid, and it basically ended his career. Um, so uh, a, a trade magazine at the time said that this case should be a lesson, you know, not to let your, uh, your art, artistic mind uh, win out over your business mind. Um, another pro tip, heights that you have yet to reach seem far more impressive than they look once you're up there. Chrysler would have paid anything to win the race until he actually won it. At that point, he was like, see ya. Um, but again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. The Empire State Building's an interesting skyscraper. It was uh, finished in 1931 in New York. It was built on the site of uh, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, uh, which had been purchased uh, in 1929, and there were rumors about who was going to take it over. Um, Al Smith was the former New York governor who ran against Herbert Hoover in 1928 uh, for the presidency of the United States. Um, after uh, Raskob, John J. Raskob, ran his campaign, he invited Raskob to take on uh, the, uh, the chair of the Democratic National Convention at the time. Now, Raskob was VP of Finance for General Motors, uh, who you might note is uh, a competitor to Chrysler at the time. 
uh, until 1928, but then he had to resign because Alfred Sloan, uh, who was also on the board, uh, was a supporter of President Hoover and said that uh, Raskob being on the DNC would be a conflict of interest. He couldn't be there and also in, in industry at the same time. So Raskob said fine. He sold all of his GM stock to finance a building and he made Al Smith the president, just not of the nation, of a company called Empire State Company. Um, Al Smith was a politician after all and so he had a flair for the dramatic and uh, this is how he actually announced his involvement uh, as the president of Empire State Company uh, and that they would uh, and announced that they would be demolishing the Waldorf Astoria and that they were going to raise an 80-story skyscraper, the Empire State Building, which would be the tallest in the world. Remember, this is around the same time that everyone and their brother was saying they were going to build a skyscraper, so nobody really knew whether to take them seriously. Um, remember these guys? Uh, Richmond Shreve and William Lamb were on the slide of the uh, Severance Dream Team a while back. They actually, at the same time that they were working on 40 Wall Street with Severance, um, based on my math anyway, they had to know how tall these guys were building um, and in October 2nd, uh, 1929, Lamb was in a meeting with some of the wealthiest men in New York, having already built a scale model of the new skyscraper, the Empire State Building. Um, this is before they had even finished building 40 Wall Street, so you do the math on that. Um, demolition of the Waldorf Astoria had already begun by this point. Uh, they had brought on um, Arthur Harmon as a third partner in their, in their firm for this particular engagement. Um, now, one of the things about Lamb was that he was artistic, just like Van Allen, uh, and his partnership with Shreve was not terribly different than Van Allen's failed partnership with Severance, but he was also a pragmatist. And so there were certain uh, constraints that he allowed to define sort of how the building had to be. And in particular, uh, the characteristics of the design uh, were determined by it needing to have an exterior of limestone and a completion date, a hard deadline. When given a tight deadline, get ready to make concessions. Now, the initial drawings for this building was, uh, crea were created in two weeks, and a final design was reached in four. Um, instead of designing the floor plan at the bottom and working up, as often was the case, Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon set a standard for light in the interiors, how much light, natural light, they wanted, and they designed from the top down, placing emphasis on how pleasant it would be to work in the, in the spaces. And so that was a really unique way to approach it. And it was partially because Lamb had decided that even when he was going to make concessions, he wanted to make sure that there was a pleasant experience for those who mattered. That lighting, ventilation, other things were not things to be sacrificed just because of the timeline. Now, who are the people who matter? Well, they're the occupants of the building. They're people like him, her, this guy who's uh, a maintenance man, and if, if you're not able to maintain the building, it's not going to be good for anyone for long. Maybe, I mean, look, occupants can come in all shapes and sizes. Maybe this, maybe this guy too. But who, who it definitely wasn't being built for is this guy. Now, just because someone is big, strong, loud, and they want to use your work to raise themselves higher, that doesn't mean you should put their needs above the greater good. <laughs> I'm glad you liked that. <laughs> so, but one of the reasons that the building's design took shape so quickly is that they were able to use parts of designs for other buildings. Um, this is the Reynolds Building in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, it was designed by Shreve and Lamb previously. This is the Carew Tower, I may be mispronouncing that, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, it was designed by another firm entirely. Uh, Shreve and Lamb had nothing to do with them. But if you take a look at the scale models um, of the two buildings on the left, you can see the similarity in design to the one on the right. You can see how they were inspired and in some cases copied wholesale, just scaled up. Um, takeaway here is to reuse previous work and even if it's not originally yours, that's okay. So on November 18th, 1929, Al Smith had just announced the purchase of land adjacent to the Waldorf Astoria, which everyone of course assumed they're gonna be, they're gonna be building bigger, they need a bigger foundation. Um, Shreve, at the time, with, whenever the press tracked him down, said the determination of the height of the building will be based on the sound development of usable space. As we proceed with the plans, the owners will be in a better position to determine what the height of the building is to be. Now, I think he could have had a career in politics as well, actually. Um, that's a very good non-answer, and it's very, he's very keen to kind of imply that, no, no, we're only going to build as high as we need for practical reasons. We have no desire to be the highest. Um, However, the next day, um, Al Smith uh, announced Raskob wanted to, hire, wanted to add more height. Uh, 
you have to understand there was a trade-off here. If they added more height, the, the architects did not want this to happen because it meant that tenants were going to have to change elevators. They literally couldn't ride the same elevator all the way up to the top. They would have to get out, go to another elevator to reach their offices. Um, Raskob didn't care because he wanted to be the highest. And so uh, Smith announces the very next day after Shreve says we're going to make practical considerations, uh, the, the important part, that five more floors were going to be added. It would bring the, the total to 85 stories and 335 meters, which is actually an overestimate by about 15 meters, but it wasn't going to matter anyway. Um, so John Raskob sitting in his office is wondering how can he add more height to the building. Uh, he's looking at this plaster model the architects had given him, and like every client ever in the history of the world, he decided he knew how to solve the problem. He reportedly said, what this building needs is a hat. Now, he didn't mean a literal hat. Um, he meant a mooring post for zeppelins. Uh, he wanted to let zeppelins dock at the top of the Empire State Building and let passengers off. And we laugh now, right? He was serious. Um, let passengers off at the top of the building. Now, it would be better than the Chrysler Building Spire because this had a purpose, a practical purpose. Practical, right? Um, <laughs> And it, but it would, it would need another 61 meters, which would let them stay true to Shreve's uh, earlier claims. They were only going to build higher based on the sound development of usable space. So Al Smith, uh, a bit later, announces, building with an eye to the future, we've determined to build a mooring tower 200 feet, uh, 61 meters high on the top of the Empire State Building, and that the Zeppelin would be. This is no coincidence, by the way, that he's mentioning how highly up the Zeppelin will be anchored. He knows what he's doing. He's playing the press. He wants to make sure they know how tall it is. Now, never mind the feasibility of docking a Zeppelin in the winds of New York City at that height, or what would happen when the Zeppelin needed to maintain an even keel and dumped over 100 kilos of water ballast on the streets below on the people. Raskob didn't have any time for that stuff. Ain't nobody got time for that. So, look, lesson is people can rationalize just about any decision, but that does not excuse you from doing your best to talk them out of it. This plan was going to add $750,000 to the cost of the building. Because it had marketing appeal, everyone was obsessed with flight at the time. This, uh, this was not something the, the architects were ever going to win on. Raskob and Smith were determined they were going to build this thing, and this, this frustrated Shreve, what's he going to do? You know, at this point, he's already neck deep in the project. Um, now, with the designs completed, it was time to start building. And do you notice something about building? Building, they designed the building right from the top down. But when it came time to build, oddly enough, you still have to build from the bottom up. Right? Um, now, the definition of bottom might change for, for you depending on what you're building and, and where you're building and what you're building on. But the only way to make sure the structure is going to stand is to build it on something that's standing. Um, but it's important to be honest with yourself. For instance, if you want to build an entire ecosystem complete with a house on top of uh, a building while considering the, the bottom, your bottom, the top of someone else's building, then don't complain when the bottom gets yanked out from under you. This, this guy had to demolish his mountain villa because he didn't have any permits to, to build up there. Um, but, you know, the real heroes of any kind of building construction, especially in this area, were the steel workers. They put in amazing work to make this happen. Construction started on March 17, 1930, and it proceeded for about 14 months. The building rose at a rate of four and a half stories per week, which was a record speed. And if you take a look at some of the working conditions these, these folks worked in, um, they weren't always, they were working very, very quickly. They weren't always necessarily working the most safely. Um, and you know, sure, they got to break for lunch, but they didn't always get to leave the office. Now, to be fair, this is actually from another, another building uh, construction, but I, I couldn't pass it up. Anyway, um, the building opened on May 1st, 1931, uh, 14 months, less than 14 months after construction began. And uh, it would be the world record for the tallest skyscraper for almost 40 years. But there were five lives lost during the construction of that, construction of that building. And you could see why. I mean, it was pretty death-defying, the stuff that they were doing. And you know, speed might be important, but life is far more important. Even one life lost was too many. But again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. The United Nations headquarters in New York uh, in 1952 155 meters tall, and if you, if you take a look, one of the things interesting about this actually, by the way, is it was constructed from 1948 to 1952, a, a period of four years, which tells you something about how quickly the uh, Empire State Building was able to go up. Um, you notice anything about the building, though? It's all windows. Uh, they wanted a lot of light, so they said, okay, let's make the whole front of the building windows. Um, and they were all sealed windows. 
And, and so, the, you know, greenhouses do that as well. And the problem is that with light comes heat. And unless you're building a greenhouse, you don't want the heat, you just want the light. It doesn't matter how pretty your building is if nobody can tolerate being inside it. The Sackett Williams uh, Printing Company um, in Brooklyn had a problem that uh, their paper was getting too damp and it was wrinkling. And when they would print on the paper, then, of course, the printing would come off kilter. Uh, and so uh, a guy by the name of Willis Carrier had developed uh, a solution in 1902 that worked by blowing air over a set of coils filled with coolant. Uh, its purpose wasn't to cool the air at that point. It was really more about regulating humidity, but it happened to do both. He patented it under the unremarkable name of apparatus for treating air, but later we came to know this as air conditioning. Now, the first space to use a similar cooling method for actual people, as opposed to paper, uh, was used in the New York Stock Exchange in 1903. Uh, for what should be obvious reasons. Look at all those people in all those heavy suits. Uh, but it was designed by uh, a guy by the name of Alfred Wolf. Uh, these things were expensive, though. Um, this one was 300 short tons, so it was, it was big. Um, Carrier, in 1922, had improved his original design with a centrifugal chiller, which uh, was much simpler. And uh, I bet they have fun captioning that, come to think of it, centrifugal. Anyway. Um, it was much simpler, and it allowed for increased reliability, cost savings uh, for large-scale air conditioning. And without this, a building like the UNHQ couldn't have existed. So engineering cool things is great, but engineering cool things that people can actually use is even better. But this talk is not about skyscrapers. Uh, the Willis Tower, uh, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the Sears Tower, and it was at the time of construction, was built in Chicago, Illinois, finished in 1973. Uh, Fazlur Rahman Khan is the structural engineer uh, tasked with building that office complex for Sears. It was going to house everybody in Chicago that uh, worked for Sears, Roebuck and Company. Um, it was going to have to be an extremely tall building. Chicago, as you may have heard, is the windy city. Uh, gusts from Lake Michigan can batter the city with winds up to 80 kilometers per hour. So the taller a steel skeleton building gets, the more susceptible it is to bending in high winds. That swaying motion creates a sensation not unlike being on a ship. You can actually get seasick on top of a building. Kahn had developed something called a tube structural system. Now, I know this doesn't look like much of a tube, but it was, and at least in theory. And what it basically did was take this steel skeleton that we had been building with all this time, and he turned it into an exoskeleton. Uh, and it provided for much better resistance against wind and shear, uh, and it, res it reduced the building's weight as well, because, and opened up more floor space, because now you didn't have these columns going through the center of your building to structure. You had that all around the edges. So it opened up more floor space. Now, unlike Mr. Lobster here, however, whose exoskeleton isn't winning him any beauty contests, Khan's exoskeletons allowed much more flexibility in design. Some of the iterations on his work later uh, resulted in some truly almost sculpture-like buildings. The point I want you to take away here is that the higher you go, the windier it gets, so you'd better develop a thick shell. Um, now, the Sears Tower was the first building to use Kahn's bundled tube stru structure, and it's just what it sounds like. A bunch of tubes, a bunch of buildings, essentially, nine separate buildings that were more or less bound together uh, into one building. It ended up being 527 meters tall at the very tip and 442 meters tall at its roof. Uh, even with wind speeds over 90 kilometers per hour, the top floor of the Sears Tower sways only 15 centimeters. Point I want you to take away here is sometimes multiple small buildings are better than one large building. But again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. Taipei 101 in 2004 went up. It was the tallest building at the time. Um, the interesting thing about Taipei is that it sits near the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is the most seismically active area on Earth. It gets hit by an earthquake roughly twice a year. And earthquakes affect a building much, much different compared to wind, a much stronger effect at the base of a building for an earthquake. And it's, in fact, easy for a, a, an earthquake to break a large building. So uh, it's pretty important to be able to test various types of structures. And one way that they do this is they build spaghetti models. Um, it turns out spaghetti models steel very nicely. It, it similarly bends, it similarly breaks under certain kinds of behavior under load. And uh, even though, uh, well, you'll see. So this is how we would test. It's an earthquake simulator. Now, look, the structure looks pretty intact, but if this had been a real building, that top floor would have fallen down and killed everyone inside. The structure was too rigid. So this is what we call in the industry a catastrophic failure. Now, the interesting thing about catastrophic failure is that the only way to assure a lack of failure is to test for all modes of failure. 
uh, in both the laboratory and the real world. But the only way to know of all modes of failure is to learn from previous failures. See a problem here? So basically, no engineer can absolutely be sure that their structure is going to stand against all loads that could cause failure. They just set a margin that is acceptably unlikely. So think about that the next time you're on the 30th floor of a building. Someone decided the chance of failure is acceptably unlikely. So <laughs> test to ensure catastrophic failure is acceptably unlikely. And please, for God's sake, set a high bar for acceptable. The designers of Taipei 101 made it rigid where it had to be, flexible where it could afford to be. Um, what they did is they had these, these tubes, these steel tubes, the yellow ones there, uh, and these were c columns that went the entire length of the building. And then they had eight mega columns that were filled with poured concrete, very, very high density. Uh, and every eight floors, they had trusses that acted like giant rubber bands around these, these, these poles so that the rest of the building could kind of move uh, flexibly. Um, in March of uh, 2002, uh, a 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit Taipei while they were still constructing. And it destroyed many smaller buildings and toppled two cranes from the top of the building. But the construction was able to resume after an inspection showed no structural damage to happen to the, happen to the building. It wasn't even finished yet. It was already standing up against a 6.8 magnitude earthquake. Uh, the engineers said that in an earthquake, it's the safest place in town. Um, the pro tip here, rigid where you have to be, flexible where you can afford to be. And you'd be surprised how flexible you can get away with. Now, one other thing they did here is they had this giant uh, tuned mass damper. Um, they had two more, but this is, this is the biggest one, up on the 90, from the 92nd to the 87th floor, it's suspended. And the way this thing works is that it's hung from these big uh, cables, and it has these hydraulic uh, attachments, arms, so that they damp the movement. So as the building is swaying, this is sort of countering that. And it's easier if you actually look at it. Here's during a recent typhoon what's actually happening, and you can see the hydraulics kind of controlling for that, that sway. And it helps make it so that you don't get deathly ill on the top of the, on the, top of the building, swaying back and forth in the wind. Um, takeaway here is that when the winds pick up, it's good to have someone big at the top pulling for you. But again, this talk is not about skyscrapers. Last skyscraper. We're running a little over, so I'll try to make this quick. Burj Khalifa. Uh, Dubai in the UAE uh, was completed in 2010. Everything we've learned about so far has been refined and applied to make this building even possible. But that's not, not what I really want to talk about. On September 11, 2001, um, the Twin Towers were attacked by terrorists. Um, and some people at that point in time uh, were saying that no super tall building was ever going to be built again because it was too attractive a target and too dangerous. Because the problem becomes one of evacuation. Um, in an evacuation situation, stairs are the only option. And, and walking down stairs, as you might not know, is actually almost as difficult as walking up them. And if you have a 70, 80, 100-story building, how do people get to safety? Well, the, the Burj Khalifa was 828 meters tall. This is twice the height of the former One World Trade Center that had been destroyed. Uh, they needed a plan to ensure the safety of people that were inside. Now, it has a naturally fire-resistant concrete core, so that helps. But even so, as you build higher and higher, more and more people need to walk further to get to safety. So how do people get out of the Burj Khalifa in an emergency? Turns out they don't. It, it isn't enough to give only one option to people in danger, leave and get out, right? Um, what they actually did was they created these areas of refuge, refuge rooms on mechanical floors throughout the building, roughly every 25 floors or so. Um, and they're built from layers of reinforced concrete and fireproof uh, sheeting, and they can actually withstand the, the heat of a fire for two hours. The takeaway here is create safe spaces. They need to be accessible as well. And this is, if you can see here, they're every so often through the building, they're accessible. You can't make them hard to reach. Uh, each room had a dedicated supply of air pumped through fire-resistant pipes. Give people room to breathe. It's not normally, by the way, fire that kills somebody in a situation like this, but smoke inhalation. And so you can see here, we actually have uh, an, uh, the stairwell here that you have to get to the area of refuge can become filled with smoke. If it's filled with smoke, then that room's no good. But there are actually sensors all throughout the building. If something activates a fire detector, heat sensor, water sprinkler, uh, high-powered fans kick in and actually push the smoke. They bring air from the outside, and they force air in and pressurize the entire stairwell so that it pushes the smoke out. So eliminate toxic elements in your buildings.
And of course, none of this is a substitute for rescue workers coming to the aid of those in the refuge room. It's not their job to just save themselves while they're trapped up there. Somebody needs, needs to help them. So help each other, especially those who aren't in a position to help themselves, because people aren't ex expendable. Uh, thank you, this has not been a talk about skyscrapers.